Okay, um, I would like everybody to keep your monitors off. Focus up here. I'm going to have some things to watch and, and stuff. I want you guys to pay attention. Um, obviously, the the class is in two halves. There's the CAD part and the uh, engineering and design stuff. And I want you guys to be paying attention to both. So. All right, uh, we're going to start with the COTS highlight. This sheet, if you want to follow along. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. So we're going to talk about we're going to talk about drive seals. Next week, we're going to talk about some other kinds of wheels that we use for other things other than driving the robot. Um, but uh, these wheels here are kind of the common ones that people use, and the the, the, the different types, I guess, the, the categories, I suppose. Um, okay, so the probably the most common one, I would say. And, and the, the simplest, cheapest wheel is a wheel that has um, a molded rubber tread. I'm actually going to pull some of these up. Um, and, it, and it's shown there. So, so typically, the, a, a rubber treaded wheel is made of plastic. It has some sort of a hub and a bore that you can attach hubs or shafts to um, that allows you to drive the wheel. And, and then the, the tread is made up of a typically fairly soft rubber that's just molded right onto the wheel. So um, rubber treaded wheels have a lot of traction. They're really cheap because they're really simple. You know, there's, there's, it's one piece, the whole thing's one piece. It's pretty cheap. Um, they tend, the tread tends to wear pretty quickly because the rubber's fairly soft and the, the treading on it's pretty aggressive and that, that causes them to wear quite a bit. Um, and because the tread is part of the wheel, once the tread wears down, you just have to throw the wheel away and you might buy a new one and you replace the wheel. So, Maintenance wise, it can be a little expensive because you're replacing the whole wheel every time. It's typically pretty easy to replace because you just take the wheel off and you put a new wheel on. So there's um, there's a few different types. Um, Vex, Vex, and Animark both have versions. There are other companies that sell stuff, but those are the two big ones that we buy from. The wheel that's shown in your handout is the high grip wheels from Animark. Um, those are the ones that come in the kit of parts drivetrain. So, so every team every year, um, unless they, they purposely decide that they don't want it, which we do, but um, most other teams get a, a kit in the kit of parts that they get at kickoff and they get a drivetrain they put together. These are the wheels that are in that kit. So um, most, a lot of teams use these. I would say, I don't know, maybe half, half of FRC teams use these. And, um, for FTC students, like the stealth wheels that you guys use, that's they, those are the same thing. They're, they're just molded rubber tread. Um, so then kind of the, maybe the next level up from that would be what's, what a lot of people call a traction wheel. Um, a couple a little more specific names. Andy Mark calls some of theirs plaction wheels because they're made of plastic and they're a traction wheel. So they, they combine the words to say plaction. Um, but it, it's a traction wheel. They also have their, Andy Mark also has another brand called um, their um, performance wheels, which is a traction wheel with a with a, an aluminum rim as opposed to a plastic rim. Um, Vex calls them, well, uh, Vex calls them traction wheels, um, I guess, according to my link. Um, but in, in your in your handout, you've got basically basically three images. The, uh, the first image in the list is the, the VEX uh, traction wheels. Basically, VEX traction wheels are um, they're plastic, they're molded plastic, they're, they're kind of modular, so they've got a few different diameters, and basically the wheels have these little slices, and you can add slices to make the wheel wider if you want to. And then the tread, which is replaceable, that's the big thing about a traction wheel, is the, is the tread's always replaceable. Um, and so for Vex, they have these little like molded rubber rings with little keys, and so you, you basically just slide them on the wheel, and, and when you assemble the wheel, and, and then if you need to replace the tread, you take the wheel apart, you pull the old rings off, you put new rings on, and, and there you replace the tread. So um, pretty easy, a little on the expensive side just because there's a lot of custom components there. Um, Andy Mark, the next two in this list here are the Andy Mark versions. Uh, the one in the middle is the flaction wheel, and the one on the end is the rim 
for uh, an NMARC performance wheel. Um, basically, the tread works the same way for both of those. Um, the same way as the tread we've used for the past couple of years, which is that blue stuff we call cake belt. Um, basically, there's different kinds of belt too. We use the blue nitrile, but there's other types. But basically, it's um, typically, it's a textured conveyor belt is, is what it is. It's fairly thick rubber with a cloth, like um, reinforcement fibers in it. And basically, you just rivet it onto the wheel, typically. And then if you want to replace the tread, you drill the rivets out, you, you take the, the, the belting off, and you put new on, right? Um, the, the blue nitrile, as far as I know, is the highest traction wheel in FRC. I, I don't. I was sitting there thinking about it for a while. I don't think there's any wheels that have more traction than those. So um, that's kind of like top end as good traction as you can get. Now, too much traction can, can be a thing, right? You can have too much traction, so not everybody uses them, but otherwise everybody would if that was always a good thing. But um, that's, that's kind of where that's at. So um, I, I put links in this handout to, to some of these. Um, so if you want to check them out, there are other options out there. There's, Wheels are probably the most widely available thing for, for robots in general. A lot of different companies make different wheels, and there's a lot of different types, so, because wheels are easy to manufacture. It's a good way for companies to, to make money, and everybody needs them. Um, OK, so the next type in your handout is called the Colson wheel. So Colson wheel is made by the Colson Caster Company. Basically, originally, uh, they still are, but uh, originally they were meant to be uh, an industrial caster. And a caster is basically just a free rolling wheel. Like your, well, I don't have wheels on mine, but your desk chairs, right, those little swiveling wheels at the bottom, those are casters, okay? So Colson, the Colson Caster Company makes casters for industrial applications, like material transfer carts, you know, paint, racks and things that go in, you know, just heavy duty stuff for, for use in factories and things. And so they have one type, they're, I guess, primarily or most well known maybe, um, line of wheels called Performa, which are these plastic hubs and um, molded rubber outside. So, so they're, they're li a lot like the, the rubber treaded wheels we talked about before. Now, the wheel itself is actually smooth, um, but uh, it's a relatively hard rubber. It, it's quite a bit harder than like the um, high grip wheels that we talked about before, and it doesn't have a tread. But uh, it still has a lot of traction. And uh, the way the history goes, at some point, somebody realized way back when like BattleBots was originally on TV and when fighting robots were a thing like early 2000s or something, people started using them, using Colson caster wheels. They started using those as drive wheels on their fighting robots. And you know, sometime along the way that made its way into FRC because they're just, they, they're, they, have, they have a decent amount of traction. Um, the, the big thing about them though, is they have a really good balance between traction and wear resistance. So they have just about the right amount of traction. They don't have too much traction, but they're also not particularly slippery, even though they don't have a tread. Um, but they don't wear very fast. They, they last a long time. You could run a whole season without changing your wheels, depending on what you're doing. Um, we've used Colson wheels in the past. Um, we Recently, we kind of made the switch to traction wheels just because with our application, we, we like to have more traction. Um, but that's cool to me. They're really good. They're, they're particularly cheap. A couple of years ago, um, Vex um, partnered with Colson Caster and came out with um, some like FRC specific Colson wheels. Because um, before that, if you wanted to use a Colson wheel, you had to basically machine or buy a special hub to go in the center of the wheel so you could drive it with a hex shaft. Because right? everybody wants to drive their wheels with a hex shaft. Uh, there's a seat there, there's a seat right here. Um, yeah, everybody wants to drive their wheels with the hex shaft, so you used to have to press in a special hub if you want to do that. Now they come with a hex, just like is shown in your handout. So that was a really cool thing, made them cheaper, made them wider available, now a ton of teams use them. Um, 
Okay, so the next type is an omniwheel. It's short for omnidirectional wheel. Uh, basically, an omniwheel is a type of caster, right? It's, it's a free rolling wheel. Um, and you can see in your in your handout that picture there. Um, the omniwheel has the, the traction surface of the wheel is made up of rollers that are going basically sideways to what the wheel would, would normally drive. And those rollers are, they just free spin, right? You can just sit there and spin them. Um, that allows the wheel, and those rollers are made of a fairly grippy rubber, and that allows those wheels to have traction in the forward direction, but they can move freely side to side, okay? So they're used they're used for different kinds of drive trains that, that need some sort of sideways motion, either to eliminate turning scrub, which is where you know you have a fairly long robot, the wheels at the front and back of the robot tend to move sideways when you turn just because of the geometry. So you, you might use them on the corners of your robot so that your robot can turn easier. Or you can use them for certain types of drive trains like we talked about a few weeks ago, like a slide drive or a holonomic drive where you need your robot to be able to move sideways. You guys remember that. If you don't, look back at your handout and talk to me. So, um, okay. So next type, and once again, I've got links in your in your handout um, that that go to different web pages, primarily from Andy Martin, um, the Vex Pro, for this stuff. If you want to look at it. Um, McCainan wheels. Um, McCainan wheels are constructed, physically constructed, quite a bit similar to Omni wheels. You've got um, a traction surface on the outside of the wheel made up of free spinning rollers, except these rollers are at a 45 degree angle, um, as you can see in your picture. Um, basically, well the application of mechanical wheels is, is different than an Omni wheel. So you use a mechanical wheel in a set of four, and there's actually left and right sides of a mechanical wheel. That's not particularly important unless you're designing something with mechanical wheels. Um, but basically, if you drive, if you use four of them on a robot, you drive each one in a certain direction, your, your robot can move sideways in addition to driving around normally. So that's what mechanical wheels are for. Um, recently, because um, for a long time, Andy Mark was really the only supplier of mechanical wheels, and when I say a long time, I really, like when I was a student. But um, in 2013, I think, Vex came out with their own line of McCannon wheels. And it took them a while to catch on, but eventually Vex came out with a, a four inch um, McCannon wheel that a lot of teams in recent years have started using as an intake because the McCannon wheel allows you to to simultaneously roll something in a, a direction like pulling it into your robot and move it sideways, which we'll talk about that next week, but um, that's desirable when you're talking about um, pulling a game piece into your robot off the floor. So um, that's kind of a, an additional, more recent use for McCain and wheels, but primarily they're used on drivetrains. Um, and then finally, um, the last type is a pneumatic wheel. And a pneumatic wheel is more like what you would think of as a typical tire, like on your car. So it's, it's got a rim. Um, your car doesn't have an inner tube, but like a bike has an inner tube. Um, the pneumatic wheels that, that we use on our robots have an inner tube. Um, and basically they've got an air-filled tire, right? Um, pneumatic wheels tend to be pretty heavy um, just because of how thick the rubber needs to be and you've got extra components are also fairly large just based on the tires that are available. Nobody makes custom tires for FRC. They, they only make, they only use tires. I think the one that I showed is the Andy Mark one and that's a tire from like uh, a mobility scooter, right? And it's just they made a custom rim for it but, but the tire is something. So anyways, they tend to be pretty heavy because they're using tires that are from an application that doesn't care about weight like we do. So um, it, you typically don't want to use pneumatic tires unless you have to, right? And then the only time you have to is if you're running over a really uneven surface. Like this past year um, in, in FRC, we had to go over some small bumps and ramps and things, and, and nobody used pneumatic tires, right? You don't, you don't need them for small bumps, but like in 2016, when we were going over all the defenses and everything and really uneven terrain, pretty much everybody used pneumatic wheels. Actually, 
the, the companies that had them could not keep them in stock. Like, just think, yeah. So um, pneumatic wheels aren't really that useful until you need them, then you pretty much have to have them. So we used them in 2016, obviously, and um, I mean, they're, they're good wheels. They do also have a lot of traction because they have tread and they tend to grip the carpet pretty well because they conform to whatever their surface they're driving. So um, that's a, a general overview of the of the drive wheels. Obviously, there are different manufacturers. Um, there's different styles. Everybody kind of has their own take on it. Um, we've obviously done custom wheels in the past couple of years where we've cut sheet metal parts and, and made our own wheels um, on FRC. Um, and that's just, that's just a version of traction wheels, what we ended up doing. So uh, those are wheels. Um, when it comes early in the season, we're going to have a discussion about what wheels we want to use. We're going to basically have the discussion about balancing traction versus maneuverability and, and weight. And, and different things, but that'll depend on what the game is. That'll be a, a discussion that happens pretty early in the season. And, and FTC students, I mean, I assume you guys have a pretty similar discussion about what wheels you're gonna be using. Uh, you guys have probably a more limited selection just based on the size, but um, it's the same kind of things are available. Um, okay, that's all I have for wheels. We're gonna move on quickly so we can hopefully have more time for <laughs> okay, this is a fairly long one. Um, reminder, turn your monitors off. I want everybody's eyes up here and I want everybody focusing on what we're talking about here. Because here's the thing. I, I mentioned this in the first class. I'm going to talk about it again here for a second. You guys can learn in better, especially FT or FRC students, sorry. Uh, you guys can learn in better. But, but robots robots are very complicated, right? There's a lot of engineering, there's a lot of design things that go into designing a robot, right? Knowing inventor is not enough. And that's why we're combining these topics in this class, right? We're not just talking about inventor. If, we, if inventor was the only thing you needed to be able to design something, we would just be teaching inventor. But it's not, it's not the only thing you need to be able to design something. And in my opinion, it's not even really the most important thing you need to know. The, when you come down to it, the software is really not that hard to use, but some of this other stuff is fairly difficult to get your head wrapped around. So that's why we're talking about this. Um, so if you guys don't understand anything we're talking about in the engineering section, or, or you're not following what's going on in the COT section, um, just I mean, ask me, or review the handouts after the class, or contact me. I mean, you guys have my contact number. So um, make sure you guys are taking to heart what we're talking about in the engineering concept section because come come build season, um, you're going to need to know it. And, and there's, you know, in six weeks, there's not really a lot of time to go back and learn. And, and really, our design is done in the first two or three weeks of the build season, so there's not enough time to go back and learn all of this stuff from scratch, which is why we're teaching it now. So, um, okay, so we're going to go on to the um, engineering concepts. Um, handout. This is a fairly long one, like I said, but um, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about different manufacturing methods. Now, why is this important? Well, basically, when you're designing something, you, you're designing it for a purpose, right? What's the purpose? You're going you're to design it, we're going to make it and put it on a robot, right? So, so what's, on, what's on your screen has to make its way somehow to fruition in the real world, right? You've got to be able to take metal or plastic and you need to do something to it to make it end up in the shape that your CAD model shows, okay? Well, it is easily possible to model something that there is no way to make it in the real world, right? I mean, that's not really that hard to do. There's, there's shapes you can make in CAD that you can't make in the real world, especially in our case, where we don't have access to crazy metal 3D printing and, and all this stuff, right? We've got a fairly small, it's a nice set of tools, but it's a fairly small set of tools um, that we can use to make things, and we have to model things that can be made by those methods. So I'm gonna talk about um, a, a fairly wide range of manufacturing methods, basically 
I'm, I'm restricting this to methods used to make one part, right? Most of these revolve around metal and plastic, um, but you know they, they can apply to other materials too, like ceramic or something. But um, we don't have access to all these methods. I want you guys to know that they're out there. Um, a, if you become an engineer and you're working for a company, and and you're a lot of a lot of companies contract out, right? They send parts out to other companies to be made, and they bring them in and they use stuff with them. Um, you'll you'll want to know what's available. Um, but, but the big thing is, when you're modeling a part, you should model no part. You should never model something that's going to be made in the real world without, while you're doing it, thinking about how that part is going to be made in the real world. Because it's just useless. I mean, if you're, if you're making a part in CAD, and you, and, you have, and, you, and you have no plan for how that part would be made, it's, it's, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Because chances are you're doing something that, that's impractical, or if you're working, you know, for the robotics team, we have a pretty limited subset. So for us, it's, it's probably a choice between we can either make it or we can't. Um, in, in a more professional setting, you might make a design that's really expensive to manufacture. I mean, you can make a lot more things if you have more tools available to you. If you have enough money, you can make just about anything. But, but you know, certain things are a lot more expensive than other things, and they might accomplish the same task, but, but one might be cheaper than the other. So it's important to know how things are made and what's available. So we're going we're gonna to talk about everything. I mean, there, a, there are a seriously a lot, when you start digging into it, there are a serious a lot of different methods that things are made, right? And I learn about new ones all the time. I, mean, I know a lot of them. Like, I mean, just over the years, it's fun to look them up, so I've watched a lot of videos. I've, I've, I've come across a lot of different manufacturing methods, and still, every once in a while, I'll come across a new one that I didn't even know about. Right? So um, I learned about a new one called um, cold flow forming, which I'm not actually going to talk about. But they use it to form tire rims. But I didn't know about it, and I learned about it. So, um, we're going to talk about a, a pretty wide variety, some really common ones, a little more specific ones, and, and such. And I, I have a few videos that I'm going to show. Yeah. So how often will you use these as a um, Well, we're going to use a few of these like, to build our whole robot. And I'll point those out when I get to them. But um, some of these we will never use at all. Okay. Um, but it's, it's kind of fun. And, and if you guys are, if this piques your curiosity and you want to know any more, um, go look them up. There's there's YouTube videos for like all this stuff on YouTube. Like you can find pretty much any of these. You can find a video of them or a video explaining. It's like this, there's good documentation that you can find online if you want to know more. So um, I'm just going to barely scratch the surface. So all right. So um, okay, let's talk about CNC for a second. Um, CNC is a term that stands for Computer Numerical Control. Basically, it's um, a word that's used to describe a machine that can execute a program that the user puts into the machine, right? So, so when you talk about automated equipment, a lot of times it's CNC. Now, don't get confused. All automatic equipment that's used, like in a factory, is not CNC. It's not everything automated is not necessarily CNC, but most things are, right? And so when we talk about a lot of these different manufacturing methods, some of them or most of them can be either CNC, right, automatic, or, or manual, right, where you, you've got a guy turning cranks and levers and, and pressing buttons manually, right, to, to do everything, right? So a lot of these have both. Um, some of them only have one or the other for various reasons, um, but I'll kind of point those out when we get to them. Okay, so I've broken this down into a few large, like, overarching classes. These are kind of soft um, that I kind of define myself some of them, and some of them are more widely in industry select or um, accepted terms. So the first one we're going to talk about is, is machining. Machining is an extremely generic category of manufacturing methods. Basically, machining is any method that uses controlled material removal to shape a part. Right. So I'm I take a chunk of material. It could be anything. Right. It could be plastic. It could be it could be any metal. It could be anything. And I just use some method of, of removing material in a controlled fashion, right? I.e., not explosives, right? <laughs> you know, mining, right, with a with an excavator or an explosive that's not machining, right? Because you're not removing it in a very controlled fashion. You're not shaping something. So, 
that's a, obviously that's a very very broad term. You know, um, using a, a chop saw is technically machining by that definition, right? So, um, which I, I think most people would agree it is. But uh, and I'm and there's a few things just to note. I'm not going to talk about like I'm not I don't I'm not talking about sawing in here because I figure all of you know how saws work, right? It makes a straight cut. Right? <laughs> you know, there are band saws, there's chop saws. You know, uh, also I'm also not talking about drilling directly, although I mention it a few times. Um, because I assume most of you know how a drill works. It drills a hole, right? So there's a few really basic things that I don't talk about, and there's some stuff that's more advanced that I, that I don't talk about. Yeah, I know. Okay, so machining. So kind of the basic one, and I got a video here. This is um, machining uses a machine that's kind of like a drill press almost, except where a drill press holds the part still and has something turning that just drills a hole. You know, this can move side to side. And basically you use something that's like a router bit. If you guys ever seen a wood router, yeah, where it's got a little spinning bit and it can basically cut sideways. It's like a drill bit except it can cut sideways. So, so this is a CNC mill. It's milling aluminum. And now this one's particularly fast. They're not all this fast, especially it's machining aluminum, which is soft. But basically that, that spinning cutter that's, that's moving around there, it's, it's spinning, it's got blades on it. And this is real time, this is not set up. It's actually cutting aluminum that, that fast. So, I mean, it's not messing around. And this is all this is all automatic. There's not a person doing this, but um, there are manual mills, right, that have cranks on it that you can move. They're called typically called Bridgeport mills. There's a number of them down in the shop. Um, but yeah, I mean, you get the picture, and and you can see they're they're making a fairly complicated shape here, um, where you know, all by just using a cutting bit. But as you can imagine, there's certain restrictions. There's certain shapes that can't make, right? And there are more complicated mills, more expensive mills. Um, the mill is what the machine is called. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. But uh, there are more complicated mills. And, and if you want to know more about this, look at the video. So, so that's mill. We, we use some milling. We Everything we do is, is manual machining. We're kind of trying to work on getting a sponsor or something that has CNC machining, which allows us to do more complicated curved shapes. Um, but uh, we haven't gotten there far yet. Okay, so the next one is turning. Okay, turning uses a lathe. Basically, a lathe holds a piece of metal or wood or plastic or anything. Um, actually, I learned a while ago at my last job they actually you can actually lathe glass, which is weird, but you can. Uh, you have to use very special tooling and, and stuff to do it, but you can. Um, uh, Milling is kind of like, of all the machining methods, it's pretty much the most common. Turning, same way, it's, it's one of the most common. Milling and turning, it, you use both, right? We use lathes um, to, 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 we have a little one upstairs, a little bench top one, a little manual one that we use to make standoffs and stuff. Um, and, and Bob, one of our mentors slash sponsors, he, um, he has a little better one at home. Um, this is a video of a CNC lathe. Um, basically, you spin the part, and then you have a, a moving static, i.e. non-spinning cutting blade that comes in and basically cuts material as the part spins. Okay? So you, you can do stuff, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what it comes down to. It's not really as exciting as milling, but you can do, you can do a lot with a lathe. Now, I'm going to see if I can find it. This video is supposed to have live tooling in it. So a lot of lathes, yeah, here we go. A lot of lathes have what's called live tooling. This is a fairly, this is only on CNC machines typically, but it's a, it's a fairly advanced feature. But basically, uh, once it finishes grooving here. So basically, the, this is the, that rotating piece with the chuck on it's called the spindle. What, what happens is the spindle can, can position precisely on some lathes. And then basically, that's a milling cutter, right? That, that, that bit that just came in, it's milling, right? So this, this is a lathe that's turning, but this lathe can also do milling, right? You could also replace that end mill, that's what that tool's called. Um, you can also replace that end mill with a drill bit, right? And you could do drilling, okay? So you can use more advanced equipment to kind of combine some of these things, so, yeah. Um, about this part, uh, is that the important to a nut? It is, yeah. Um, well, some sort of a screw, but yeah. There's all kinds of videos of this stuff. So, so that's that's turning. Now, um, grinding. Uh, grinding basically uses an abrasive, right? So these are these are cutting processes. 
They use a blade, right? And they and they cut. And grinding uses an abrasive, which basically uses a rough, a rough, really hard material that that slowly removes the material slower than than a um, a mill or a lathe does. So, um, grinding machines um, typically. Typically, grinding machines focus on a flat surface, right? You don't really do a lot of complicated geometry with grinding like you do with a mill or a lathe, right? Um, they typically focus on a flat surface or a, or a round surface. You can draft grinding circles or flat planes. And basically, grinding is a lot more precise, but a lot slower than milling or turning, okay? So if you need something really precise, you need to be really, really specific size, you use grinding. And, and the machines are set up kind of similar to lathes and mills in terms of rotating bits and, and, and things. Um, a lot of the most common ones, like surface grinders that are that are flat, they just have a grinding wheel, which is just a disc, and it just goes back and forth and slowly removes material. That's a pretty common machine. But grinding, I mean, there's all kinds of grinding machines. There's, there's grinding machines with special bits that, um, that can grind like gear teeth or like the grooves and drill bits, those are there's a special kind of grinder that, that makes those grooves, the, the spiral grooves in a drill bit, that's done with the grinder. So grinding, um, it's, it's a pretty broad category, there's a lot of different things there, but um, that's one of them. Okay, so um, I broke this next category, so that's, that's kind of like, that's machining, right? Now this next category I call parting, like, like separating, not like part as in a, a part, but part as in to separate. Um, parting, I, as far as I know, is technically machining, right? But I kind of separate it out into its own category just because it makes sense. And basically, this is where machining, with like milling or grinding or turning, um, everything that's not part of the finished part gets turned into chips or, or dust in the case of grinding, right? That makes sense. So I've got a block and I want to turn it into a crazy shape. Everything that's not part of the final part, it's, it's, it's chips, little pieces, right? Um, which is great, but you know that material just goes to waste, right? It gets thrown in a bin and, and gets recycled, but but I don't get to use it for other parts. I I pay for that material, but it just gets scrapped, right? Um, so um, parting is typically used with like sheets, sheets of material, or or rectangular, large rectangular pieces, or, or big plates of material, and it's basically where I I make a thin cut. Right, and I can cut out parts out of a flat sheet. Okay, so that's that's kind of what this category is. So, the the first one is a laser cutter. Basically, a laser. This is a little bit not not everybody knows this, but if I just take a laser and I fire it at a sheet of metal, it's not going to cut it. Right, it's going to melt it into a puddle. Right, even if I focus it really really tight, it's not going to cut a nice clean hole through it. Right, I've got to have some way of in a really controlled way pushing material. Out of, out of the cut. So laser cutters use a laser. The laser provides the energy to, in a really, really focused spot on the sheet, to melt and vaporize the material. It's out hot enough that it actually vaporizes some of the metal if you're cutting metal. Typically you cut metal with a laser. Or typically you only cut metal with a laser. If, if you vaporize plastic, it has a nasty um, habit of making like cyanide gas and other nasty chemicals that you don't want to breathe in. So. Um, usually you don't cut plastic with a laser. There are smaller laser engravers like they have down in the fab lab that you can cut plastic with because it's got a good ventilation system and everything in it and, and you cut types of plastic that don't. But really powerful lasers like um, um, like the ones shown here, you don't cut plastic with. Anyway, um, so you, you, you have a nozzle that's, that's pushing gas out in the same path that the laser beam is firing, so as the laser melts and vaporizes the material, the, the gas, which could be nitrogen, could be compressed air, could be oxygen, um, pushes the molten metal out of the cut and makes a nice clean cut. Okay. Um, and lasers are really fast. Okay, I mean that's cutting complicated geometry within a few thousandths of an inch pretty quickly. Yeah? Um, do lasers have a uh, cleaner cut than what happened before? With the uh, drill bit thing, um, a mill. Uh, lasers have a pretty clean cut, right? They do have a pretty clean cut, especially in thinner material. As you get thicker, 
Lasers get slower and the cut looks messier, but it's still pretty good. Uh, but typically a mill is gonna have a smoother cut. But a laser is much, much faster. And, okay. and yeah, it, it's much, much faster. So this is a promotional video, but basically um, lasers can cut up to inch and a quarter metal typically. Most lasers can't cut that thick, but some can. The one that, that's shown here can do it. Um, most lasers cut half inch material and under. Um, we, we use a laser cutter. One of our sponsors has well, actually this brand of laser cutter and they let us come in and use it. So, so all the sheet metal on our robots, our robots are primarily made out of sheet metal, which is you know, flat metal that gets cut and bent into shape. Uh, we're going to talk more about how to design that stuff next week, but um, we use a laser cutter, right? So when you're designing something, you got to think about it's got to be able to be flattened into a sheet and then cut out of a laser. So we'll, we'll talk about more of that next week. Yeah. So the one that um, we get to use can be cut up to an inch and a half? Uh, inch and a half. Or actually, the one that we have access to can do up to seven eighths in steel. They get it. Um, aluminum and stainless steel are a little harder to cut just because they're optical properties. They, they tend to reflect more light because you're cutting with light, right? And so you can't cut as thick a material in aluminum or, or stainless just because it's optical properties and, and thermal properties. So, um, all right, that's laser. Okay, so plasma, plasma works, uh, and obviously, just a quick note um, about lasers. Lasers are always CNC machines because if you've got a guy who's got a handheld laser cutter, lasers don't really stop when they go through air. They kind of tend to keep going. I was in a class for the laser cutter that we actually use. I used to work for the company that sponsors us. Um, and I went to the training for, to operate the laser. And before the laser is focused, right? Before the laser is focused, the laser beam is about 5 eighths of an inch in diameter, about that big around. Before the laser beam is focused, <coughs> The danger range that they list is five miles. So that laser can hurt you five miles away. And that's before it's focused. Now, once it's focused, it, it tends to, it, it, it converges and then diverges again. So that it probably, once it's focused, it probably actually reduces the danger range, but um, for longer distances. But anyways, so lasers tend to not stop. So having a handheld one is pretty dangerous. Although there are a few lower powered handheld laser systems out there for different things that that, um, that are available. So is it the radiation that would be damaging? Well it's just it's just a focused beam of light. I mean it can blind you and if it's intense enough it can burn you. I mean just like I mean it you know it's, it's um most modern lasers are like an infrared light range that so you're not a visible light they're infrared so they heat up things very quickly. Uh, okay, so plasma, plasma is the fourth state of matter, right? So plasma cutters use a, a ionized, or ionized means it's made into a plasma, it uses a, an ionized gas, which is really, really, really hot, um, to cut material. So basically, it uses electricity, it uses an arc in, in the head of the, the cutting um, machine to, to generate the plasma, and that plasma is directed in a narrow jet and it functions a lot like a laser where the plasma heats and melts slash vaporizes the metal and also simultaneously pushes it out of the cut. So plasma cutters, lasers are really expensive, really expensive. Like big ones that can cut metal are like more than a half a million dollars, <laughs> right? Very expensive. Um, plasma systems on the con to contrast are really cheap, right? You can get a little handheld plasma torch, because plasmas are much, much safer for, for handheld because if you think about that jet of plasma, it doesn't go out very far. And actually most of the way the way the electricity works, it really, you can't generate a plasma in the middle of air. It has to be up against something for it to work. So um, and that's just has to do with the way the, the electricity is, the current is directed. Um, uh, but you get a little handheld one for like $1,000, right, which obviously doesn't Still a lot, but compared to half a million something, and then yeah, plus the insurance that comes with it, right, right. Um, well, I mean maintenance too. It's, it's there's less part. Lasers are complicated. There's a lot of parts that can break. Um, plasmas aren't. So plasma CNC plasma machines. There's handheld and CNC. 
Uh, CNC plasma machines look a lot like a laser where it's got this head that's moved in two axes and it can cut sheets, right? Um, okay, oxyacetylene, um, also called oxyfuel cutting, basically uses a flame to cut. Um, and it uses acetylene, which is a gas. It, sometimes they use propane, but usually it's acetylene. And it uses pure oxygen gas. Okay? So when you, when you burn something in air, right, it reacts with oxygen and it, it gets hot, right? Well, the rate of combustion and the temperature, and therefore the temperature of combustion is controlled by how, how much oxygen there is to react with. So you, if instead of burning it in air, you burn it in a stream of pure oxygen, it burns a lot faster and a lot hotter, okay? And as it turns out, acetylene is the hottest flame you can get for oxygen reactions. With, with fluorine, you can get hotter, but nobody wants to mess with fluorine because it tends to make hydrochloric acid gas as the exhaust product, which nobody wants to mess with. So, um, but with oxygen flames, oxyacetylene, that's the hottest one. So you can melt metal really, really easily. So basically, you use, you use a directed flame of oxyacetylene and oxygen to heat metal, and then you direct a stream of oxygen gas without the acetylene through the metal, and actually iron and, and other metals, I believe, will actually ignite under certain conditions where there's pure oxygen available and a lot of heat. So, so iron will actually burn, and it burns very, very hot. So actually you use the oxyacetylene to basically light the iron on fire and then the iron continues burning and you direct it with the stream of gas and it basically cuts a lot like a plasma cutter or a laser. Now lasers create really smooth surfaces. Plasma, not so much, but it's still not bad, especially in thin material. Um, oxyacetylene, um, well, one thing I didn't mention, um, plasmas can cut thicker materials than laser, like three inches. The company I work for Eagle Crusher uses plasma tables for cutting like really big pieces of steel for making rock crushers. So, um, and then oxyacetylene, right, kind of continuing the progression. Oxyacetylene has an even worse cut quality. It's really lumpy and kind of rough because it's, it's just really just melting through the material, but it can cut even thicker materials. I had a video that I found a long time ago of, of some company cutting like a 36 inch block of steel with an oxyacetylene torch. And I looked for the video, but I couldn't find it. I think they took it down. But you can cut stuff that's over a foot. And there's not a lot of opportunity for that. You know, nobody really cuts steel that thick, but you can with oxyacetylene, and you can with plasma or laser. Uh, OK, so another one, um, those are thermal processes, right? They, they dump heat into your, they dump heat into your part. When you're cutting metal, heat kind of screws with the the me mechanical properties of the metal and can, can be, that can be problematic, right? If you're, if you're heating your metal too much. Um, water jet uses a really, really high pressure jet of water with an abrasive in it. Um, the water can be over, is typically over 60,000 PSI. So really high pressure, some, some systems are double that. Um, but basically you, you have these really tiny abrasive particles in the water stream. The water goes through this nozzle, directs into a really thin stream. The water acts as a carrying agent. The water doesn't do the cutting, the abrasive does the cutting. But basically you direct it in a stream and it can cut in the same fashion, kind of on a gantry, like, um, like a, uh, a laser cutter or something where you can cut sheets with it. Um, water jet can cut, well, the nice thing about water jet is you can cut just about anything because it's not, there's no heat, right? So you can cut plastic, you can cut, uh, you can cut watermelons with it. There's, there's a whole, there's at least one, there's at least one channel on YouTube and all they do is just cut random crap with, with water jets, right? So you just stick, you can stick like a TV in there and cut it with the water jet if you want to, and they do dumb stuff like that. Uh, but water jets are nice because they don't, you know, you couldn't do that with a laser because the laser would just melt plastic into a lump and, and just certain things wouldn't be able to be cut. But, you know, water jet can. So water jet can cut really thick stuff. Um, a lot of companies use water jets to cut granite for like art stuff and like decorative things on buildings and things. So um, water jet's really nice. Um, the cut quality is pretty good. It's not as good as a laser, but I would say it's better than a plasma. Um, water jet, the, the one drawback of water jet is it's kind of slow. Um, 
slower than laser or plasma, um, and I would say it's faster than oxyacetylene. Um, but um, it tends, as it cuts and thicker stuff, the water jet kind of diverges, right? It flares out as it goes through the material. So your cut, what's called the kerf, which is the kerf is basically the material that's removed by the cut, right? So the kerf, the kerf is fairly wide, right? It removes quite a bit of material, and it gets wider as it goes through the material, which can be a problem sometimes. Um, lasers and plasmas and stuff do that a little bit. The water jet's kind of notorious for it. Lasers don't really do it as much, but um, yeah. What about cost? Cost. Um, water jet is fairly cheap. So if you're cutting a material that can be cut with a laser, water jet, water jet's going to be more expensive, right? Um, but if you're cutting, but but it's it's compat. I mean, it's 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 competitive. It's um, I don't really have good numbers off the top of my head, but um, a, a laser can or a water jet can compete with a laser for, for thicker materials. And when you're cutting stuff like granite, you can't do it with a laser, really, at least not as far as I know. OK, um, one final thing um, called uh, EDM. Now, this one's an interesting one. EDM, not a lot of people know about EDM, but it's, it's a fair, fairly common. Um, basically, what EDM does is it takes a wire it says pencil's the wire, right? And it takes a block of metal. It only works for metal, as far as I know. Actually, I take that back. You can do it with plastics. I, I think it has to be a specific kind of plastic. But typically, it's done with metal. Um, basically, you, you dunk the whole thing in a dielectric fluid, which is like a, an electrical insulator. Um, and it's, typically, it's like mineral oil or something based off of mineral oil, typically. So you dunk it in this fluid. And then you apply a voltage to the wire, and you apply you know, a negative voltage to the part right, under, inside the solution. Basically, the dielectric insulates the wire, right, so you can't get an arc from the wire to the part. Except when you get it really, really close, when you get the wire not actually touching the part, but just barely off the part, an arc can actually form, right, a spark. So, Basically, you pulse it really, really fast, like thousands of times a second or hundreds of times a second, depending on the machine. And basically, all these little sparks will form, and you, and you very slowly move the wire into the machine. And the, every time a spark hits, it, it vaporizes a little bit of material, right? And, as you, and, and, and the dielectric functions in such a way that it's a very, very consistent distance from the wire, right? There's not a lot of variation there. I mean, it, it cuts. The same distance from the wire, every single spark, right? So basically, it's gonna it's gonna remove the high points, right? Whatever whatever's closest to the wire is where the spark's gonna form, and then that blows a little material away, so the high point's somewhere else, and, and so it's forming all these sparks along the wire. Yeah. Um, is EDM more accurate than um, a laser? Yeah, by far. So the thing you'll notice in 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 um, making things, right? If you can remove material in a really slow and consistent fashion, that's a really precise way to make things. If you can remove material really fast, it tends to be less precise, right? That just, I mean, that kind of makes sense. So um, EDM is very, very slow, like very slow. But it's extremely precise because you're, you can remove things like nearly at an atomic level. I mean, in theory, you could remove like a layer of material that's just a few atoms thick if you wanted to. And I mean, in practicality, that's not really always possible, but you can remove material in a very precise fashion. So you can do things like this, right, where two pieces that fit so perfectly together that when, when they're lined up, you can't see the line, right? These, these two pieces of metal are so perfectly fit that air can't even escape out between them. Right? But they can still slide back and forth. Right? And it just disappears. I don't, know, I don't know how much of that's just because they're using a low quality camera. I've never actually seen. There's tons of pictures and stuff of these types of things where they slide together and you can't see it. And I don't know. I don't know what it looks like in person. I imagine there's probably a small gap between the person. But, but anyways. Hold
Okay, so that's that's EDM. EDM's cool. We don't use EDM, but EDM's used in the tool and die making industry because it's really, really precise. And you can use hardened materials. And the EDM doesn't screw with the hardening because you know that spark is only removing a little bit of material at a time and it's not heating the surrounding material, which is what the problem is with like laser and plasma. Okay, obviously you don't have a handheld EDM because it's so slow. Okay, so we're going to talk about deforming. Now this is basically where machining takes a chunk of material and removes material to make the finished part. I'm going to call deforming a general class of where you take a chunk of material and you, you basically smash it until it's in the shape you want. Now that can manifest itself in a few different ways, but we're going to talk about those. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about bending first, right? Bending is typically, it, it, it's basically for, for sheet metal and, and plate, right? Flat pieces, you, you, you bend it or fold it, sometimes it's called, um, to make flanges and tabs and things that you can use. Now, um, we use bending, so we use a laser to cut flat sheet, and then you use what's called a break, which is basically just a bending device. There's several different kinds of breaks, but you use a break. That's B-R-A-K-E, like spelled like the brakes on your car, not like brake as in brake, but um, I don't really know why it's called that, because it doesn't break the material, it bends the material, but er, you go. Anyways, um, basically the most common type is what's called a press break. There's a picture of it, I, I put a picture in the handout because it's a little hard to explain, but basically you've got what's called a punch, right, which is a roughly blade-shaped thing, and this is long, right? It, it, this is a cross-section, and this is long, and whatever, however wide your part is is how wide your punch needs to be. And then you have a, a corresponding die called a V-die. Typically, typically your V-die is a different angle than your punch, right? It'll be, and then basically you take, you take your material and you lay it across there, and typically the brake is hydraulically actuated, and it can be it can be manual where you just got a, a lever or a button and you just run it down until you, you, you like it. But a lot of a lot of press brakes, that's what this is called, a press brake. It's one particular type of brake. Most press brakes are CNC where they'll automatically come down and go the right distance to bend your material. But as you can imagine, as this punch comes down, it forces the material in and it bends it, and that, that makes a nice consistent bend. Okay? It doesn't have to push the material all the way to the bottom of the die to bend it. That's a, a key thing. Anyways, we use a pre we use a CNC press brake in addition to our laser to make most of the parts, most of the structural parts of our robot. Okay, so let's talk about stamping and punching. This is a huge thing, and you can make just about anything you want out of sheet metal with stamping. Basically, you use something that's called a stamping press, and the stamping press has a tool. It's called a stamping die, right? The, da the die has two halves, kind of like this has two halves. The, the stamping die has two halves. It has a punch and it has a die, right? And basically, you put a piece of sheet metal in between the two, and this huge press smashes the two together with like tens, hundreds, or thousands of tons of force, and it forms the metal into a particular shape. And this can this can look. I mean, it's, it's I, I can do a whole thing on just how stamping is done in all the different types, but. Um, this is a little video, and typically it's done in stages, right? So you, you don't stamp the whole part all at once. You do a little bit of a bend, then you let the material kind of relax, and you do another bend. Stamping can also punch holes. It can, it can add all kinds of features. And this is a, I think there's a better view. They're taking a strip of material in here, and they're, um, they're doing a process called deep drawing. I used to work for a company that, that did a process similar to this to make um, shells for oil filters. But they're basically taking a flat sheet and they're forming it into a cup in a multi-stage process. You can see these little, these little grippers are grabbing the parts and moving them down. And, and you, know, you can see the little parts are in here. They're kind of hard to see. I think they show a better view a little later in the video. But um, this is what's called a transfer stamping press what it's typical because it's transferring, and there are other types. But as you can see, every time that strokes, there's a little better view of it. Every time that goes up and down, there's a part coming off the end, right? And this is not even a particularly fast press. There are presses 
forming smaller parts that can do multiple parts per second. Right, that, that press is moving up and down several times a second and it's making the parts. So stamping is used for a really, really high volume production. There are huge stamping presses, like they're, they're basically a building by themselves that stamp all the parts for a car body, right? That's how, that's how the car bodies are made, they're all stamped. Pretty much everything on your car is stamped, right? Um, because it's really cheap for high volume production. So that's stamping, it's just, it's a huge thing. Um, all kinds of different things that are made by stamping. Um, okay, so rolling, rolling is, um, well, it's kind of a generic one. I thought about not throwing it in, but I threw it in. Anyways, basically, um, you can take material that's hot or cold, right, room temperature or heated red hot, and you can pass it through a series of rollers, and the rollers shape it in a certain way. Typically, when you're making sheets, right, flat sheets of material, that's how flat sheets of material are made. They take a, an ingot, right, that's made of molten metal, so they melt the metal down from the ore and make it into an ingot, and then they put it through a bunch of rollers, red hot, and make sheet. Right? So that's rolling. Rolling can also make other shapes. Um, a lot of steel profiles. We talked about raw material a couple weeks ago. Um, or maybe that's last week. Or no, it wasn't last week. Anyways. We talked about raw material at some point, talked about angle and channel and I-beams and things. Those are all made rolling in steel. Now in aluminum, they use a process called extrusion. Now extrusion is basically where you take a billet, which is really just a large bar of aluminum. You heat it up. You don't heat it to its melting point, right? You, you heat it up to the point where it just softens a little bit to make it easier to work with. It's like 400 degrees, I think, for aluminum. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's like 400 degrees for aluminum. Um, the melting point of aluminum is like 1100 degrees, depending on the type. So um, not, it's not anywhere near the melting point, but um, they take this, base, this big billet and they basically shove it and they force it through a die that has a hole in it that's shaped like the part that you want to make, right? It comes out and it basically extrudes it into this big long um, shape. Um, and you can, you can even do, you can set up with certain die arrangements. You can actually do things that are hollow where you have something that's inside and it, and it extrudes over top of it. Um, I just wanted to show a picture. I mean, that's a pretty crazy one. Right, so you can do really, really complicated shapes with extrusion. A huge amount of, of stuff is extruded, right? Um, so most, most aluminum profiles, like angles and things like that, are, are, um, are extruded. I mean, things like, um, like window frames, like the parts that make up a window, those are extruded, typically. Um, okay, so forging. Forging is kind of like stamping, right? Um, forging, except with forging, you're not typically using sheet. Typically, you're using a block of material of some sort. And you're and you're you're not stamping it at room temperature. That that press I showed you that that was working at room temperature. That was forming metal that wasn't heated. Well, forging forms metal that's heated. Okay, um, and and that has a few advantages. Obviously, it's easier to work with. You can work with large chunks of material and still be able to deform it. Um, the other thing is um, forging. Um, alters the grain structure of a metal and actually makes it stronger. So forged parts are used for like things in airplane engines and parts in like race car engines and things, things that can be really, really strong. Um, okay, so then I'm uh, running out of time here so I wanna kind of move on quickly, just hit a couple of these. I'm not gonna talk about all these. Um, some of this stuff later in this list isn't really as applicable to us, so if you guys want to read the rest of this, you can. Um, casting um, or molding is basically where you melt a metal or a plastic and you, you pour it into a mold or force it into a mold under pressure and you can make shapes that way. That's another generic category. I talk about a few there, I won't go into them. I, I have some fairly detailed explanations of, of the different methods and stuff that are used. One thing I do wanted to mention was sintering. Sintering is not really 
casting, right? But basically, it's where they take a metal powder and they <clears throat> take a press and they force it into a die and they basically smash the metal powder together and it kind of like stays there. And then they bake it, right? They don't heat it up to the material's melting point because then it would just turn into a puddle. But they heat it up to a certain point where the metal softens just enough that all the particles of the dust will flow together and they'll stick together and it makes a nearly completely dense part. Okay? That's used for making really complicated shapes that are needed in really high volume that don't have to be very strong. Right? They're also made, you can also control the density of the material with sintering if you don't smash it together all the way. Um, and that can be used for creating like filters and, and mufflers. Okay. Um, okay, so the one thing, the last thing I want to talk about was additive manufacturing because we do use this. Um, the most common additive, additive manufacturing is what most people call 3D printing, right? Additive manufacturing, kind of the generic term. Um, the most common type, the type that we use, is called fused filament fabrication, or FFF for short. Basically, that's where you take a spool of a thin filament of plastic and you force it through a, a heated nozzle, the plastic melts, and then you, you kind of use the nozzle in a, it's a CNC machine, and it, it moves around and it deposits that plastic in a layer and then it moves up and it deposits another layer of plastic on top of that. It moves up and creates another layer on top of that. The important thing to understand is those layers don't stick together perfectly. So the part is stronger in certain directions than others because of the layers, right? You can, you can break the part across the layers easier than you can break it across the layers. So that's something to keep in mind when you're designing. Also with fused filament fabrication, um, you, you have, the layer has to sit on top of something, right? And so if you've got a part that has overhangs or something, you've got to have construction material, extra material that's placed there so you can have something to put your geometry or your, your actual part material on top of. Um, there's a couple other ones. Um, you can read the thing if you're, if you're curious about those. I'm not going to go into them for time. Um, but there's some other widely used methods of 3D printing um, that I go over there. Okay, um, so that's our time for that. So we're going to move on to CAD. Now, uh, was anybody other than, let's see, you two, was anybody not here last week? Okay. Do you guys have flash drives? Um, you do? What? Oh, um, Andrew, you want to, or Coulter, somebody want to help you with that one? Get it back in. Okay. Um, Austin, you don't have a flash drive. I forgot. Okay, well, that's problematic. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let me, let me do this real quick. All right, I'm going I'm to give you the files that we ended last. Uh, it's, um, Coulter, you want to log this in for me? All right. Project for good reason. Um, we're gonna. 
I, I gave you guys drawings. You have five drawings. This is the finished product, right? These are the, the plans. You can see what it looks like when you're done. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna really take this all the way to the point that my example did. We're not gonna put all the screws and things in. Um, sometimes we will in our robot. Sometimes we'll leave the screws out. But for for the sake of time, I'm not gonna have you guys do it just because that's that's for time consuming. So um, if you haven't, change your settings, activate your project file, and open the layout sketch slash end plate file that we created last week. <coughs> okay, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of just blast through this as quickly as we can. If we don't get this done, okay, if we don't get this done, I, this is the reason I gave you guys the plan. So you guys have all the parts that you, you know you need. All the part numbers from all the different suppliers are in this parts list up here with all the balloons. So you know where to download the CAD models from. Um, I also, in the same Google Drive folder that has this week's handouts, there's a, first of all, there's a PDF copy of each of these, right? There's also a folder that has all the files for the complete gearbox, all the inventor files. It needs to be their inventor 2018 files, so if you don't have inventor 2018, you'll need to install it. But um, you can download that whole folder, you'll need all the files, and you can open it if you want to look at it. So I would encourage you, if we don't get done today, which I, I'm sure some of you won't get done today, um, go home and before next week's class, finish this gearbox. If you get stuck, you can open the files that I have and look at the sketches and look at all the dimensions and things and look at how it's modeled and try to get your copy to look the same. Okay? All right, so all of you have this part up, right? Helpers, you're gonna need to keep an eye out because if people start getting off in the weeds and their part doesn't look exactly like what I have on my screen, this is gonna take a really long time. So if you see anybody that has stuff that's not fully constrained or not, correctly set up, make sure you help them out. Okay, so oh, edit the sketch. Now this is, and you can see on this on this print here, this is what we're making. Um, we're making these end plates. Both end, both both plates for the gearbox are gonna be the same. Um, and that's what we're making here. So I'm gonna go to, and you guys should too, open up Chrome. Yep. Open up uh, open up your web browser and go to vexrobotics.com. Let's see, what's the easiest way to do this? Alright, we're going to download some bearings. Okay? I'm going to do a few of these, then we'll, then we'll finish modeling the plate, then we'll start assembling. So, Okay, so go to Vex Pro, green link, go up to hardware, go to bearings. Okay. Go all the way down, click on CAD files. Alright, we need to download three different bearings. Okay. You need to scroll down to where it says flange bearings. The first one on the list, 3 8 hex ID, 1 and 1 8 OD, flange bearing. Click the download button. The, the first one in the flange bearing list. So you just got to scroll under the CAD files tab, you just got to scroll down until you see flange bearing is the first one in that list. Okay, download that one. You just click the download button, now move on. It's the next one down. Download the next one down. Okay. So the first two in that list, and then this one here, fifth one down. It's also a half inch ID, but it's not a hex bearing, it's a round bearing. Okay, click the download button on that one too. Should be three of them. Is everybody still with me?
Under flange bearing, it's these two, and then the fifth one down. So the first two, and then the fifth one down. Okay, using Chrome, it's easier to use Chrome because you'll be able to just duplicate me. Just right click on one of these and click Show in Folder. It'll open your Downloads folder. Select all three of these files. Cut them out of there. Go to your flash drive. And then paste, paste them in your paste them in your in your flash drive. Okay. We're gonna go through, we're gonna download all the files we need because it'll save us a ton of time. So we're, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna keep going. Everybody, did everybody get those files moved? Yes. Um, Andrew and help, he's having trouble copying his like yes. files. Scroll down to the bottom, 
and it's going to be the second one from the bottom. So I guess second from the top and second from the bottom. Okay. Okay. Now go up to motion. Go back to gears. You need to scroll down. I think yeah. Twenty dp three eighths hex four gears. Okay. It's got this like little gear with the hex in it here. Up in motion. Coordinating downloads to 20 people. It's not so easy. What is DP stand? Diametral pitch. Austin, weren't you here last week? Nope, no. Oh, you were. I think you were. No, he was. No, I. I, I a lot of <laughs> Just disclaimer: Do not expect me to remember if you were here or not, because I can't keep it straight. Oh, yeah. and there's, there's people out there, and I can't remember who's this or who's that. We should take it ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Everybody got this? Everybody here? Should have it open. Everybody with me? Everybody still awake? Nobody sleeping? Okay. Go all the way down. Go to CAD files. You should have that down by now. Third from the top, 16 tooth aluminum spur gear, 20 dp 38 x 4 Download. Download. Okay, you all get that? Okay, go back up to motion, go to gears again. I suppose you could be clicking the back button, but... Okay, down towards the bottom, it's, it's right under the one we just went to, 20 dp half inch x 4 gears. Okay, click on that. 20 dB, uh, half inch X. Before we were at 3 8 X, now we're at half inch X. Okay? Guess what we're going to do? Scroll the bottom, follow the bottom, click add files. Okay, now it's going to be down a ways. Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere. You're looking for 60 tooth aluminum spur gear. Okay, now there are two. There are two right next to each other. Don't click the wrong one. Oh, no. There's one that says. Versa keys, and there's one that doesn't say Versa keys. So click the one that doesn't. Click the one that does not say Versa keys. The first, it's the first one. Uh, so click download. Oh, there is one more thing I do want to. I do want to download. <laughs> Actually, we're not going to do that yet. Okay. All right, so now right click on one of the downloaded full files, go show in folder. You, if you cut earlier, the, the files you didn't download earlier won't be in this folder. If they are, don't select them. But if they are, just hold shift and select the bottom one to select all of them. Right click, cut, then go to your USB drive, go to your CAD class file, and just paste them in there. How many do we do? Should be four. Okay, so we just downloaded seven files. How I get rid of this? Need for what? Oh, is it going to be back Yeah, you just click download. Hey, Colter, you want to help him? I can't see his screen. I'm sure that what he's going for. I'll give you guys a second to get your files in the places they need to be. Project kind of throwing you guys to the wolves a little bit, but that's you got to just jump in and start working on stuff at some point. So, 
Only the strong survive, right? No. <laughs> that's, not, that's not quite how engineering works, but. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. I'm, we're going to finish the model of this plate here so we can get some geometry in 3D. Um, now, we downloaded a bunch of bearings. Okay. We've got to have holes that those bearings go into. Now, we talked about bearings in our second class. I'm going to go over it a little bit. If we look at the bearing from the side, they look like a little hat almost. It's a really out of scale drawing. And then they have a hole through the middle. Right, and they've got two yeah, parts, so the inner part turns and the outer part stays still. Okay, this this little lip that goes all the way around, this, this being a cross section, the little lip is uh, what's called a flange. Right, basically, basically what you do, you can make a hole and you can put the bearing in the hole, and the flange stops stops the bearing from falling through the other side of the hole. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to put a, a hole in our plate. That's the same diameter as this part of the bearing. Okay, so we just download the model. And normally, if you don't know the size of the bearing, you would go get the CAD model, you download it, you measure the diameter, and you put the right size hole, right? But to save ourselves some time, we're just going to tell you what the diameter is, and we're going to make it. So, um, we need it's it's one point one. I'm going to write this. One point one two five inches in diameter. That's one and an eighth of an inch. Okay. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, you're gonna get a circle in your sketch. And make sure your construction geometry button is not pressed. And we're gonna need we're gonna need to put this hole in the center of two gear shafts. So so the output shaft, which is the bottom one, make a circle. I've got them here, it's just I can't keep working and keep and take my flash drive out. So if you, if you have a flash drive, come plug it in, take the flash drive there. Actually, all right, do you guys do this? You create a circle, okay, one and eighth of an inch in diameter. You need to create another one up here. Not, not the top circle, but the middle circle. Go ahead, go ahead and do that one. Helpers, you guys keep an eye. Diameter's written on the board, guys. I, I'm, I'm doing something else, so I'm trying okay. to go on. <laughs> yeah. so, so you guys, you're going to create a circle here, and you're going to create a circle here. I haven't created the second one yet. Okay. Oh, there we go. Same. The, the, the two circles will be the same size, guys. Uh, There's, there's two files. Oh. Um, all right. So you guys should have something that looks like this. Right? That's yeah. finished product. Okay. Now, the motor, the motor has a little boss on it. If you open, you don't need to open it, but you can if you want. If you open the model that we imported last week, this is the model of the motor. The motor has this little little boss on the front, right? And, and these are the bolt holes that, or screw holes, I should say, that the that hold the motor onto the plate. So we have to create a hole in the plate to locate this little boss. That's actually what it's for, right? You want the motor to be in a precise location, um, and and just bolt holes aren't a very particularly precise way to locate something because bolt holes have a little bit of looseness in it. So if you just bolt something on there, it can move a little bit. And when we're talking about gears, especially small gears, a couple thousandths of an inch make a difference, right? So we use the boss on this motor, which is a really precise diameter. We make a precise diameter in our plate, and that holds the motor in a really precise location. 
and then, the, and then all the screws have to do is just hold the motor to the plate rather than holding it in location. So, um, if we use the measure tool, we can measure the diameter. This is 17.8 millimeters. We're going to create one that's 18 millimeters, 0.2 millimeters larger. It's just very slightly larger. I mean, 0.2 tenths of a millimeter is not very much, but uh, we'll create one that's 18 millimeters in diameter. So if we create another circle at the top here, oh, this, this center point up here, you can type, by default, Inventor assumes your dimensions are in inches. But if you type in mm, it'll put things in in millimeters. So type in eight, oops, type in 18 mm, <coughs> and then press enter. And then when the dimension is created, it's going to show it in inches. So eight, How big is it? 18 millimeters. What is the decimal? Why is it 18? I didn't say 18 mm. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you can, you can tell it millimeters and it'll convert to inches for you. OK, everybody get that? Yep. OK, finish the sketch. Yeah. Now extrude it, this outer region, quarter of an inch, point, point 0.25. Now there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, quarter inch aluminum, we're going to make this out of aluminum, or we would if we are making it. Quarter inch aluminum is pretty strong. And this part of the bearing from here to here is a quarter of an inch. And typically, for for robustness and for proper support of the bearing, you want to support the full width of the outer diameter of the bearing. So we're going to use a quarter inch thick plate with a hole in it, so so the plate will kind of like end right at the back of the bearing, and the flange will be at the front of the bearing, right? So it'll kind of just perfectly fit in the plate. Yeah. So why did we make all those construction geometry? So that helped us do a couple of things. So it main, the main thing it did is helped us figure out the distances between these holes, right? right? And if we changed, because we typed in an equation, like 60 divided by the diameter of pitch, right? if we change the number of teeth on the gear, we just go in and edit the equation and it'll re-figure out how to It's just a fast way of figuring out how far apart. And then we visualize to make sure our plates were big enough to cover the gear. All right, you can click OK when you're done. All right, now we need to add a few more features. Make sure you guys are saving as, as you're going through this process. OK. OK, so now we got to add the bolt holes for the motor. They're 29 millimeters apart, centered on the motor shaft. So, Create a sketch on the front face of your part here. Okay. Now here's what we're gonna do. We need two. We need two holes that are in a line. Right. We've got a. We've got a point there already. That's on a circle. Right. We've got this point. We need. We need a hole here and a hole here, evenly spaced, horizontally centered on this point. So here's what we're gonna do. Create a construction line, right? So construction line, create a horizontal line, okay? Now the distance between these two holes is 29 millimeters. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a line that's 29 millimeters long, and then I'm pressing enter. That creates a line, I'm done with the line tool, so I'm pressing escape. So now I got this line segment. Now it's, it's kind of just floating around. Okay, we got a line segment? Okay, use the, just put it down somewhere. Make sure it's not attached to anything. If you, if you attach to the edge, if you attach to this point, if you attach to the circle, you can delete it and start over. And you can delete stuff by selecting it and then hitting the delete sheet. Okay, so use the coincident constraint to constrain the center point of the line, which you can see highlighted by this little green dot, to this point in the center of this top circle here. You guys get that? You good? Wait. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, 
prayer and help you. Yeah. Yeah. I already I'll, I'll, I'll hit you up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in here where he's in the room. See the yellow dot. Yeah. 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 Construction geometry for its intended purpose, right? We're using it to constrain holes in the way that they should be constrained, right? <laughs> when you're done with that, you can finish the sketch. Okay. 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 You gotta have the center points. You create the thumb points. It's up, it's up near the, it's in the sketch. It's up in the line. It's gonna be in the sketch. So up in the line, like up by the line, so that's where we go point to turn the X on it. Was it point zero five or a one? You got three holes? Okay, so we're going to sketch on it. We're going to sketch on that. We're going to sketch Okay, once you guys are done with this, you can create a whole feature. I'll get back to you in a second. I'm going to go here. Okay, so. Look, I thought you were supposed to look. Click on the hole. He's a Once you've done the line, exit the sketch, like I said, and, and, and click on the whole feature up on the ribbon under the 3D model tab. Okay? Now, what you're going to do, this is going to be a clearance hole. So we're going to have a little screw that's just going to go through this hole and it's going to thread into the motor. Okay? So you're going to click down here, so you're going to click this button right here. Now it'll probably take a while to load, so click. Click the second radio button here and just let it do its thing. Is it? Okay. Oh, okay. Good. All right. Everybody good? 
<laughs> I hear somebody and I was like, no, I'm not good. <laughs> I think my whole thing is. Can we click on the handout? This. Uh, I'll get back to you. I'm a kid. We have the. I think I'm doing it. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> 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 metric M profile because this is going to be a metric screw. Um, ignore the flathead machine screw, that doesn't matter for what we're doing. And then under size, I believe it's an M4. And I'm not going to say the time to check it because it really doesn't matter. Normally you check what screw size goes to the motor. No. No, you should be. Yeah, yeah. Under this top drop down list, you've got to click ANSI so metric. Oh. Right. Yes. It's in my pocket. What we're doing? Yeah. We're going to click clearance hole, you're going to go to ANSI metric M, and you're going to click M4. Okay? Termination should be through all. It should be by default, but in case it's not, click OK. Uh, no. I tried to do bad things. I need to plug my flash drive back. <laughs> Yes. No. Thank you. 
backwards. See, like mm -hmm. SolidWorks, mm -hmm. instead of just having an extrude, you have an extrude, and then you have an extrude and that cut back to the back does that. It's a different tool. Okay, so you guys can see how we use we use a sketch, we use construction geometry to locate holes a certain distance apart. Okay, so now now we need to create now that, that motor is gonna get pretty hot, right? And it has vents on the front and air needs to get to the vents so the motor's gonna overheat. So we gotta create some holes. Yeah. Um, you've got some extra sketches, but it's not going to hurt what you're doing. You'll need to go out and hide those or delete them. I think you have an extra sketch. Uh, but don't worry about it. it. It's okay that it's showing. Yeah. Um, you did something too wrong. Okay. All right. So create a sketch. Okay. Now, what we need to do, and we're just going to create four quarter inch holes. I don't remember what the spacing is. So basically, around this hole, we're going to create a quarter inch hole. Quarter inch hole, quarter inch hole. Now how we're going to do this is we're going to create a construction rectangle, okay, with um, a center center point rectangle, okay. So create a sketch like I did. Go up to rectangle. Go to two point center. Third one down. Turn on your construction geometry. Then you're gonna on the center point. You're gonna place the center point in the rectangle. You're gonna move out, right? You're gonna place it down somewhere around here. Really doesn't matter. Don't type in any dimensions. Just just click it down. Okay. Get out of the um, get out of the rectangle tool. Now. Is this supposed to be in? Uh, yeah. Oh, oops. I okay. Now. This is what's called, this is really what's called a, it's not, these aren't bolt holes, but this is kind of like what's called a bolt circle, which is where you've got bolts that all, are all located on a circular pattern. Now it just so happens to be four, so we're using a square. You could use a hexagon or something to, to pattern things if you have six holes or an octagon for eight holes, right? Um, I got a cheat here real quick. I don't remember what diameter I used. So we'll create a, okay. So now what we want to do is we want to create a circle. Does it matter what size that? No, we'll, we're going to mention here in a second. So we're going to create a circle that's 27 millimeters in diameter. This should also be a construction circle. Now this is going to be the circle that all these bolts fly on. Press enter. Okay, now we got this circle. Now use a coincident constraint to attach a corner of the rectangle to the circle. So a coincident constraint. Then you're going to use that to connect the corner of the rectangle to the circle. And now the, this is, you guys can find your own methods that work for this. This is how I do it. Um, just because doing this with geometry is just quicker for me when I'm working. Yeah, you have a little drop down up here, arrow by rectangle. Okay, next, next, we want this to be a square. We don't want it to be a rectangle. So use the equals constraint. I click on the top of the rectangle, and then on the side of the rectangle to make those two lines that make up the rectangle make those the same length. Okay, so now you've got a square, right? An actual square. Get out of that tool. All right now, place a center point on each of the four corners of the rectangle. Make sure before you click, make sure you're actually getting this little green dot highlighting. If it's yellow, bad things will happen. If, if it's yellow, I'll haunt you for the rest of your life. <laughs> You won't know, but sometime I'll just pop out of nowhere and say you didn't constrain it right. <laughs> You'll never know when. Okay. You guys good? 
All right, so finish the sketch. Create another hole feature. Now you're going to go back to this option over here on the left, just the normal dimensional hole, and you're just going to type it into the box. It's going to be 0.25 inches. These are just these are just air holes, right? So they really aren't important. Quarter inch is about the right size. So you want to watch. You don't want this part to get too thin, right? Because you want this, you want some strength here. But that's that's plenty of material. It's not very much, but it's, it's plenty. Um, click, click OK. Make sure you save your part. You don't want to like be like me, where I dive under a desk and actually turn off the computer and lose a whole part. So. All right, we got 15 minutes. We're gonna keep going. Quarter inch. Quarter inch. Oh, here's another thing. If you guys aren't, if you guys don't, if you guys don't have a good sense of. Um, uh, how to convert between fractions and decimal inches. I mean, you can do the math in the calculator, right? Like 1 16th is 1 divided by 16, right? That's what it is in decimal. Um, there are charts on the internet that, that show you. You can print one of those out and keep it near you. When I started doing this, when I was a student, I just printed one out and I put it near my desk. And over time, I just memorized them. I mean, there's no real easy way. You just got to use it, and eventually you'll learn. Yeah. You, you could do that as well, yeah. Um, yeah. For some reason, for some reason, I, that just always bothered me to do that. And for complicated equations, it gets a little annoying because you have to add parentheses and stuff. But, but yes, I do that. And that's, I mean, that's a good way to do it. Okay. Um, all right. Now we just need to add holes in the corners of this gearbox for our standoffs. Okay. So we're gonna do. We're gonna. Pretty sketch and then on the front face here. Click. I think. Can I do this? Um, what's the best? I think you need to project geometry. Alright, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna project geometry for this front face, right? As you get green lines around everything. Then I'm gonna turn on construction geometry. Then I'm going to use the offset tool. I'm going to offset this outer rectangle in a quarter of an inch. Okay? And then, yeah, then enter. Now what I'll do is I'm going to place, now this, this rectangle offset from a quarter, the corners represent where I want the holes for the standoffs yeah. that hold this whole thing together. I'm on the corner. So just place the center point on the corners of that resulting rectangle. Then finish the sketch. Back to um, ANSI unified screw threads, which are English sizes. 
top drop down box, this, this option, top drop down box, then it's going to be size number 10. That's a clearance hole for a number 10 screw. Okay? And then the inventor will automatically fill in the size and it ends up being 0.201 inches. So it's like, okay? Uh, I don't know why your inventor is not automatic. Because normally, when you create a hole feature, it automatically puts holes in all the points to the side. I don't know why you're doing it. Uh, clearance hole. So here, this option here. So it's going to be, you're going to pick ANSI unified screw thread, and then you're going to pick number 10. And then drop down below the rectangle. <laughs> if you guys are happy, if it's not selecting the holes, right, if your holes aren't showing up like this, you can click centers over here and then click on the points where you want the holes. Uh, my inventor's functioning normally, a couple of your inventors is not doing that for some reason, I don't know why. So if you're encountering that, I think there's an option for it in the settings that we don't You can just turn that on and off. Uh, by default, it's on. Um, yeah, so I mean, other people do use these computers. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 And then I'm um, going yeah. to yeah. 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 Okay, and in a gearbox like this, you typically want pretty significant radius. So we're going to click on fillet. By default, it gives you an eighth of an inch fillet, which is pretty good. So just click on the edges of the corner. Make sure you're not clicking on this front edge. Don't click here, click here. Okay? Make sure you click on the edges. It's going to try to select all kinds of things that you don't want to select. Make sure it's, before you click, make sure the thing that's highlighted is the thing that you want to fill it. If you get, if you need to deselect an edge, if you click a wrong edge, like if I click this front edge, I don't want that. Hold control and click on the edge again. Same thing with a circle. You can fill a circle, right? If I click on a circle, hold control and click on the circle again. Okay, you know, go all the way around the four corners of the part. You're going to have to orbit. Remember, you can do that by holding shift and middle mouse. So orbit. Click on all four corners and then click OK. Give it a save. All right, we have one more thing to do before this part's done. No, uh, the default's on. Default's doing OK, we need to set the material. So if we go up to where it says generic, click the drop down list. Go to aluminum 6061. The color will change slightly automatically to deep inventors aluminum. Okay, now if you want to know, give it a say, if you want to know how much this part weighs, you can go over to the browser, right click all the way up to the top of the browser, and you see the part name, right? The file name of the part. Right click on that, go down to I properties. Now go over to the physical tab. Click the update button. Top of the browser, right click, go all the way to the Go to the bottom of the menu that shows up and click I properties. The dialog will pop up. And then go over to the physical tab. And then in order to see the mass of your part, you're going to have to update the update button. And then this, this box here shows you, shows you the mass, the, the weight. So our, our plate is 0.368 pounds. If it's not 0.368 pounds, you did something different than I did. I did. So the Okay, you can just close out of that dialog. And you can do that for assemblies too, right? Assemblies have high properties, and you, you click the update button, it will pull in the weights of all the components to say what weight is. All right, we got a couple more parts we're going to make here. So, create a new part, standard.ipt. Right, so 
this guy here? Create. All right, this part's real simple. We're gonna make a standoff. Circle on the center point. Point three. Point three seven five. That's three eighths of an inch. That's a pretty common size that we use. Um, press enter. Finish the sketch and extrude. Um, I already did, uh, to save time, I already did some of the work to figure out how wide all this stuff needed to be. Um, normally when you're designing something like this, you'd have to figure that stuff out yourself, but we don't have time. So it's 1.125. Now this is just a bar of material oh, we yes. need to have a task hole on either side. Yeah, so create a sketch. Yeah. Actually, I'm curious. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, create a sketch on the end of the part. Place a point right there in the middle on the origin, and then finish the sketch. It's gonna be a thread pull. So once you're done with that, click the whole button, go to the third option over, in this little row here, the, the third radio button from the left, click that, it's gonna take a million years to load again. It actually came up, it actually did the whole thing. <laughs> okay, termination, you're not going to want termination to be through all, you're going to want termination to be distance. Now, you're going to pick the size of the thread, and you're going to pick the number of threads per inch. So it's going to be a number 10, you'll have to click the drop down and scroll up. It's 0.19, number 10. Then from the designation drop down box, you're going to pick 1032. Say again? What were those measurements again? For the drop down? The drop down, it's, it's going to be, right, can you see, can you read? It's a, uh, okay, I, I don't know how small this is on the screen. It's uh, the first one, the size where my mouse is now, it's 0 0.19, number 10. And then the one next to it, uh, you can see it's uh, 1032 UNF. What do you think? Just like do you have this selected here? Yeah. Do you have this? There's a point one there. What was the second dimension? Hello. We're losing daylight. Shut up here. Now I'm confused. Oh, no, no. That's 1.9. Yes. Yeah, By default, it's up. Yeah, there you go. You guys scroll up. I don't know. 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 There's a lot of options in those drop downs. You're going to have to scroll. It's not going to be in frame when you pull it up. Or you have to scroll and find it. And then the one next to it is going to be 1032 UNF. Okay, it'll automatically fill in the, the hole depth. And basically, this is the law, the deepest hole you can tap with a normal tap. So that's a good number because really you can't tap a threaded hole deeper than that. So if, if it doesn't do this, we need to make sure this full depth thing is checked because that, that makes the thread the full depth of the hole because sometimes you don't want to tap the whole depth of the hole, but we do. Okay, click OK. Now do that on the opposite end of the part again. Just repeat the same thing. Sketch, point, hold. Opposite end of the part. Finish the sketch, create the hole. Settings stay the same. Oh, wait, it's already ready. Yes. It went all Whoa! Through. Yeah, it'll, it'll, and then make sure you save your part. You should be able to see through the end. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll, it'll break through the middle, but that's okay because when you actually drill this part in real life, that's what's going to happen. So you're actually going to drill all the way through and then you're going to run a tap from either end. But Mine went all the way through. Uh, did you select the right? Red. Yeah. Sure. Did, did, did. So did it, did it say e the depth of each of the holes should have default to the 0.536? Oh, termination. Right, right here where it says termination, that should be distance, not through all. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, that was like the first thing I said. I need to work on something else. Okay, save this part. <laughs> okay, um, we're just about out of time. We're going to model one more part really quickly, one of the shafts, to show you guys how I do it, and then um, you guys are going to have to figure out how to assemble it You're on your own. Um, maybe I'll, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll go on, maybe I'll just go on my computer and I'll do a screen recording. All right, create a new part here real quick. Now we're going to create a hex shaft, right? But what we're going to do is part of that, we're going to take part the end of the hex shaft and we're going to turn it down so it's round, so it'll fit in a round bearing. And the reason we're going to do that is we don't want the shaft to be able to slide through the bearing, right? A lot of the setup of this part, and I wish I had time to go into the reasons why it's constructed the way it's constructed, but um, we, we, we want, when the bolt, when the gearbox is bolted together, we want it to, we don't want the shaft to be able to fall out of the bearing, right? So we got to have shoulders and things that are resting on each other and flanges and things to stop things from being able to come apart. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, so under rectangle, like polygon, it'll default to six sides. That's what you want. Okay, now by default, this hexagon can rotate. Right, it can it can turn, which is not what we want. So you use a vertical constraint to, to, to make one of the sides straight up and down. Then dimension the width of the hexagon. Okay, to 0.5 inches. Okay, then you're going to extrude that out. 4.3125. Wait, say that again? It's up, uh, I guess you can't even see it. <laughs> I wrote it here on the board if you guys can't see the screen very well. The distance. Wait, three, one, two, five. That's that's the depth of the bearing, right? So that's that's the depth from here to here. So what we're gonna do is that hex will butt up against the front of the bearing, right? And only the round can go inside the bearing. That's the reason. Yeah, that. that hexagon on the center point, we can use one of the origin axes 
as the center line. So if you expand the origin, you go down, it should be the Z axis. If you right click and turn on the visibility, now you've got an axis that goes through the center of your part. Okay? And you can use that axis in an assembly to, to constrain it. I use a lot of work axes and stuff to, to, to constrain stuff. If you do work axes, is easier than trying to select weird stuff. Okay, that's all the time we got for today. Um, sorry about the time I planned this out months ago. Figured we could do this in two weeks and it turned out good. <laughs> Um, all the CAD files are on the Google Drive. You want to start to finish. If you if you want to try to do this, you can you can open up my you can download my files, open them up, open all the sketches, look at the sketches, look at how it's done, and duplicate it yourself. I'm not making any promises, but I might also try to like go on my computer and record something where I'm working on my computer step by step to, to go through all this stuff. But um, yeah. Good work today, guys. Yeah.